All right, excellent. So we are getting started. Welcome to everyone who is spending some time with me to learn a little bit about chronic tissue injury and then the role of enzymatic or enzyme therapy for these chronic tissue changes that we might be seeing in some of our patients and our clients. Before I jump into the content, I do want to give just a little bit of brief housekeeping is all of our webinars are always recorded. So you will be one, getting a link to that recording, or two, you can find it on the Dr. Splicko Podiatry YouTube channel, which you will be shared that link. You will also get a link to the PDF of this presentation because we do have some references at the end, just in case you want to do a little bit more researching or you want to re-listen to this webinar. The content itself should run about 45 minutes and then we will save enough time for any of your questions that you may have. If you have any of those questions as we go through the content and the presentation, just type those in early. There's a chat box. There's also a Q&A box. I will be checking both of those. And then if for some reason you get disconnected again, don't worry, we will be sending you the recording. So this is a webinar that is sponsored by StepStrong, which we will be speaking about. StepStrong is a supplement that I am a medical advisor and spokesperson for. So I do wanna make sure that I have full transparency on that, but I'll be sharing a little bit about how I met the company and how I've been really taking a deep dive into enzyme therapy for my patients. Now, if this is your first time listening to any webinar with me, um, then welcome. Pleasure to meet you. I am a functional podiatrist and a human movement specialist. I do see um, part-time patients because I'm running several other companies that I'll briefly mention, um, but a majority of my patients are really focused around chronic pain, chronic conditions, chronic tissue changes, such as what we're discussing today, chronic movement disorders, and then chronic movement dysfunction. So really this chronic nature is something that I've really shaped my practice around. Um, so I just want you to understand that I come at this from that perspective. And then in addition to private practice, being a podiatrist, I have my online education company, which is EBFA Global. Uh, and I create much, much, much content out of that. Uh, and then I'm also the founder and CEO of Noboso. So uh, follow me on any of the social media or stay tuned as I love to put out content. Okay, so let's get down into the purpose and the goals of this webinar is you as a movement specialist, a therapist, a uh, professionally, a coach are most likely experiencing clients and patients that are presenting with various types of musculoskeletal injuries, whether that's plantar fascial pain, Achilles tendon pain, post-tib, IT band, insertional bicep femoris, anything with the rotator cuff. We have obviously many muscle tendon junctions in the body that can start to get flared up with overuse or disuse. Now, depending on where in that musculoskeletal injury uh, cycle they present to you, you may be um, approaching them all with the same kind of protocol or the same checklist of treatment options. And when we think of just kind of a classic musculoskeletal injury, if we want to think about the foot, you have someone with plantar fascial pain, call it plantar fasciitis. We'll talk about plantar fasciosis, of course. And most likely you are turning towards something in anti-inflammatory. Maybe it's icing or it's oral NSAIDs. It is topical NSAIDs. Maybe you go more the natural route and you're recommending CBD oil or red light therapy. Or we're thinking of, well, what is the role of different injections, such as a classic corticosteroid injection? We're going to tell them to take it easy. Don't stress your foot. The whole rice rest ice compression elevation is probably recommended to some level with your clients and, and patients. Maybe for foot, foot specific, you're recommending orthotics or arch supports, or maybe your patient is recommended that from their podiatrist, or they are being referred to you, or you are referring them to physical therapy as a way to try to uh, handle this musculoskeletal injury. Again, looking at this standard conservative treatment protocol that we are looking at. 
Now, let's say in some of your patients and clients, they're responding right away. They respond to almost textbook, right? Within a couple of weeks, they're starting to get better. And then they eventually start to get stronger and they go back to whatever activity it was. Every once in a while, you're getting this outlier patient and you are kind of running out of options. You're throwing your hands in the air or you're banging your head against the wall and you're just wondering why are some patients responding and others not? especially when you're using this same protocol. So what we really want to understand is when we are approached with that patient or client with a musculoskeletal injury, regardless of what it is, the question that we need to be asking ourselves is how long have they been presenting with those symptoms? And if they presented with those symptoms for a short window. So let's say they say, oh, my plantar fascia has bothered me for two weeks. And if you say, oh, it's acute, it's acute, it's two weeks, right? The classic textbook of a chronic condition is going to be six months, two weeks, we're in the clear, it's acute, I'm going to this protocol, that is my checklist of conservative treatment. However, what we need to make sure that we're doing is that there are a lot of patients and clients that wax and wane and become almost cyclical in the presentation of their musculoskeletal injuries. So what I like to ask these patients is, okay, how long in this experience that you have right now of your plantar fascial pain, how long have you had that? Two weeks. Okay, great. Have you ever experienced this before? Oh, yes. I've been experiencing it every couple months. I get a flare up for the last five years. That is a completely different conversation than the person who has never, ever felt plantar fascial pain in their life until these last two weeks. Okay. So we really want to make sure that we are asking the right questions to paint the picture, to understand what potentially could be happening to the tissue and the state of health that that tissue is in. So understanding tissue injury is very important. And we want to understand which phase of the healing process are they stuck in and how can we help them get past or reignite the healing cycle for these different patients and various conditions. So let's start with the acute. This is the itis, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis. Maybe they've had it for a couple of weeks, never had it before a day in their life. So we are having a moment of inflammation. And I know that there is a massive controversy around this, but there is an initial, if you don't want to call it inflammation, maybe you don't want to, but there is some sort of vasodilation response that happens around injury, acute injury, and that acute injury in connective tissue is micro tearing. You get this micro tear or a micro injury or an irritation to the fibrils or the tendon uh, fascial attachments to the synovial sheath that surrounds the connective tissue or the tendon. And that is often associated with overload or too much or too fast of tensile force. So the strength and load capacity of the connective tissue, usually this is muscle tendon junctions, tendon connective tissue ligaments, the stress threshold is being hit and you're fatiguing the mechanical integrity of these structures. You then get this acute injury presentation. Now, classic acute injury cycle is that you're going through three main phases. This is whether it's a wound on the skin, it's a tendon injury, it's an ankle sprain. There's this classic uh, acute injury cycle. This could also be post-op as well. So when you have a surgery, you are essentially injuring the tissue and then it goes through the cycle. So we are breaking it down from inflammatory. Yes, that word came up again. Inflammatory, repair, repair and remodel. We go from something that is days to weeks to months. Okay. And again, this is acute, fresh tissue, freshly injured tissue that's never been injured before. Okay. In that inflammatory phase, essentially what you are doing is there is a 
vasodilation and a recruitment of growth factors to the area so it can start the process. It's almost like get all of the military to the site so that they can do what they need to do. This is classically associated with an increase in vascular permeability, which is why we get edema and swelling. So if you have a acute injury, whether it's a contusion, um, so yesterday I was taking aer aerials and someone fell off a ladder like 20 feet high. It was <laughs> quite intense. And he had a massive contusion to the front of his shin, not on the bone, but in the muscle and was having some issues kind of plantar flexing and putting a little bit of stretch on that contusion. And I uh, was evaluating him and I was like, you need to ice the boop out of that because you need to kind of allow, but kind of mitigate or control this inflammatory response. Yes, we need to recruit the military and get it to the site to repair, but if it becomes uncontrolled, then this is where we get into um, some of these uh, less predictable healing cycles, let's say. Okay, this is also where compression would come in. So I would get patients who would have a severe ankle sprain. And if you sprain your ankle and it's starting to swell, you've got to wrap it then. If you allow it to boop, balloon out and then you try to wrap it, it's a completely different animal than you trying to mitigate that vasal permeability and the response. Um, you, you can't then try to wrap it and like get all of that edema and permeability to calm down. It's, it's really that initial presentation that you got to kind of get on that. Now, let's say you have a couple days, your plantar fascia is irritated or the Achilles tendon, this inflammatory, get some of those growth factors to the area. You then start to enter the repair or the proliferation stage. Now, this is going to be weeks. And what's happening here is a really, really important step is you are now kind of turning off that inflammatory response. You're saying, okay, I don't need this anymore. And what's actually really interesting is even in musculoskeletal injury, which is we'll call it a, you think of it more as inflammatory tissue injury, that is also an immune response. So just like how if you get a insect bite, it's the same process, right? You start to get this initial vasal dilation permeability to get the white blood cells and the microphages to the area to protect yourself from infection. That's an immune response. It is still an immune response when you start to get muscle tissue injury and you are part of the cycle as well. So if you are seeing the word immune system, immune response, that is still part of this, even though we're talking about musculoskeletal injury. Okay. Now, what we're trying to do in this repair phase is that we're trying to um, kind of start to clean up the area. You are starting to get some of the fibrin deposition. So this is where you could say there's going to be more like a scar, scar tissue response. And then that goes into your third phase, which could be weeks to months, months. Okay. And this is the remodeling. And this is where it's really important that you are trying to create organization to this area, organization to the micro tears and the collagen that was used to repair those micro tears. Okay. Now, if you have an acute injury, that's, it's a naive new tissue that's never been injured, injured before first time injury, that healing time for that should be a couple days to maybe six weeks tops. Okay. This is where I, I love to get these patients because you say, listen, if you just do my protocol for two weeks and you'd be awesome and consistent about it. I know within two weeks, you're going to be back out there where you need to be. Okay. Hard to say that when we start to get a little bit more chronic in our presentation. Okay. Now what starts to happen in this three phase cycle, and you have this acute injury presentation to the connective tissue or the muscle tendon junction is now you have the patient and the compliancy of that patient to do what they need to do to get through these three cycles efficiently and uh, properly. What happens is let's say they're a runner and they love to run. And even though they start to feel their plantar fascial pain, uh, no pain, no gain, right? I'm just going to maybe take two days off. Okay, I'm feeling better. I'm gonna go for a run again. And what happens is they start to disrupt this very controlled 
cycle of acute tissue injury. And then they start to kind of get in a, I call it a hamster wheel, where they start to get a little bit backlogged and then you almost become uh, stuck. And what I find with these patients or what I tell patients is in this chronic presentation because of your unfortunate improper control through this acute cycle and you loaded the tissue too quickly, which means you re-injured it and you stayed in this cycle, is everything kind of, think of it like gears moving and then the gears like, and then they stop. And then you, you just kind of get stuck. It's stasis. It's a murky in a sense. I'll tell patients it's kind of like their tissue is like um, water that's sitting and it just kind of gets stale in a sense. That's how you can kind of think from an analogy perspective of what's happening with these chronic tissue injuries. So if we do not control the way that we are loading tissue because of the human nature of wanting to stay active, we might fall under a chronic tissue injury. Now, a textbook answer of chronic tissue, if you were saying to someone, when, how, how long have you had your plantar fascial pain? And they said over six months, so six months or longer, and this is the first time they've ever experienced it, and they've experienced it for six months, that is now chronic. That would be your plantar fasciosis, tendinosis, okay? That's a textbook, textbook answer. But again, please be very mindful in how you're answering asking those questions, because if they had it for two weeks, but they've had it for five years on and off, and they get these flare ups, the, the tissue nature itself is most likely going to be um, how I'm going to describe it right now. Okay, so chronic tissue injury, what we have is that healthy connective tissue, our tendons, our plantar fascia, our rotator cuff is made of collagen type one fibers, collagen type one. It's a very rubber bandy, it's elastic, it can transfer energy well. It has great load capacity. That's collagen type one. When we injure ourselves, these micro tears, these micro injuries in our connective tissue repair themselves with a collagen type three. Collagen type three is very different characteristically from type one. It is less rubber bandy. It's a little bit more stickier. It's immature. So if you want to kind of use that. So the load capacity of type three collagen fibers is very different. It's not as strong and it's not really our innate strength of our connective tissue. So what we also see is that these type three collagen fibers, they're no longer organized in a nice parallel um, kind of systematic way. They are kind of haphazardly thrown down. So I kind of think of it like this. If you want to visualize like a haystack, it is disorganized collagen that is not in the direction of tension. So if I need to pull tension this way and my fibers are maybe sitting like this, I have obviously a compromised load capacity, okay? Now, another part of it, not only is the collagen that's being deposited disorganized and kind of haphazard, but also are the blood vessels. So part of the repair response of a fracture in the bone, a tear in a tendon, a sprain of the ankle, whatever it is, is that you get the vasodilation and the vascular permeability and then to repair, the body starts to create what are called neovascularization or neo blood vessels. Neo meaning new or immature. They really don't provide any full blood supply, but that was really their intent. So you get neovascularization that is also disorganized with collagen type three that is disorganized. And then you get an increase in ground substance, which is kind of, you can think of it as the substance that is in between the collagen and the elastin. Um, this is where you could start to think of it like a haystack, like water that's sitting, it's stasis, it's static, right? All of that is going to then obviously make tissue weaker. So now you are trying to load and then that throws you into this hamster wheel of recovery. And then patients start to go through a 
physical therapy assembly line and they get injured, then they go back, then they go to PT and then they're healed, healed, quiescent, and then they get injured, then they go back and they just get in this cycle. And then for plantar fascial issues, this is where the podiatrist may throw their hands up and say, we have to do surgery and we're going to release your plantar fascia because I don't know what else to do. I don't know what else to offer you. Okay. So this is, again, this is where I specialize in my practice. I was trained as a surgeon. I do not do surgery anymore. I try to serve these patients by pulling them back in, explaining what is happening from a tissue injury perspective, and then really going through these four steps with them and saying, this is what we need to do is we need to address this locally. Now I do want to add just as a brief aside is part of the referrals of patients that I get have chronic foot in this case, because I'm a podiatrist, chronic foot injuries, um, post-tib tendinosis, plantar fasciosis, perineal tendinosis. And what happens is they, part of their physical therapy journey and their chronic tissue injury journey is that they would do traditional PT, not respond, keep staying in the cycle, go to someone who's a little bit more integrated, which I fully appreciate, but that integrative physical therapy is trying to look at the system and says, you have chronic plantar fasciosis in your right foot because your right glute is not engaging because of uh, you're not breathing the right way and you have lacked, you're lacking T-spine rotation or something like that, right? So then they start to address the movement pattern in this patient and the patient still isn't getting better. So they're still banging their head against the wall. What I say in that case and what I encourage you to think about as a professional is that is awesome and we need to do that. But do we have to first, before anything else, look at this local tissue injury and what is happening. If they have a chronic plantar fascial pain, osis, for the last several years, and they're not responding to the global movement pattern correctives that you're having them do, we have to pause everything, stop, look at the foot locally and the tissue and see what can we do to help get that tissue in a state that it needs to be so that it can bear the load of their movement patterns. And once we get them into a quiescent state or a more healed state, can we then look at the global system and continue with what you were doing? That's, that's actually a lot of the patients that I get. So I pull them off of that. I address everything locally that I'm going to go with you over with you right now. And then I send them back to you or whoever they were seeing, and then they continue down that journey. Okay. So just really important as a side. All right. So this is the four steps that I look at when I have a chronic tissue injury. First one is that we have to break the cycle of injury. If they are stressing the system, they've got to stress the system. Do I have to put them in orthotics? Maybe I do. Okay. This could be just temporary. There's nothing bad or negative of putting a patient in orthotics if one, they actually need it, or two, if it is a way to decrease the stress on the system to break the cycle. We got to rip the bandaid off. We got to pull. We have to do something abrupt to get that tissue in a not fully immobilized. I try not to do like a full cam walker, but I try to get them in something that's a little bit more supportive. If they're doing, if they're running and it's running, that's the trigger. I'm sorry. They have to stop running. I have to get them off of it. Um, will I use an ASO brace for post tib issues or lateral ankle issues? Absolutely. So that is definitely the first part is I got to control the stress, the stress part of it. Okay. The second part that we want to look at here as part of my step two is going to be reducing the formation of the ground substance. Also remember the ground substance and the collagen type three and the fibrin and the neovascular vessels is it's kind of sitting there like, um, like the stasis. So we have to clean up. We got to vacuum and get rid of that stuff. Okay. So that step two to clean the tissue out 
This is called fibrinolysis. Now, there's a couple different ways that we can do all of these systems, right? But I want you to think of this as several steps. The, the technique that I'm going to use to speak about fibrinolysis is going to be obviously enzyme therapy, right? And step strong. But I just want you to then keep that as, okay, what am I doing as my step two? Okay, maybe I am recommending step strong to them while I have them in an orthotic. And then while I incorporate number three, which is optimizing collagen production in the maturation so that we start to get healthy collagen formation. Am I doing Graston technique, which has been shown through research to stimulate the fibroblast? Am I doing a stem cell injection to help stimulate the fibroblast and repair the connective tissue through collagen type one formation? How am I bringing organization to this injury that has for the longest time been disorganized? And then step four, at the appropriate time, underline that, I am starting to introduce graduated slash progressive loading to these new collagen fibers, okay? So again, we decrease the stress, we pull it off, okay? We start to address what is the garbage we need to clean up, Fibrinolysis. Once you clean up the garbage, how do we then build new organized collagen through the stimulation of fibroblasts? Then once we have that and continue doing that, we start to slowly introduce graduated progressive load to those new collagen fibers. Okay. When I take a patient through this whole protocol, and let's say the step three that I'm doing are stem cell injections, it is a three month program that I'm taking them through. If you remember that on the chronic tissue injury slide, that recovery for a chronic tissue injury is anywhere from three months to the research says six to nine months. You could even argue sometimes up to a year, right? So scar tissue, like when you have an incision, scar tissue remodels for up to a year. Um, so my average, when I do stem cell injections and take them through this, like I said, it's going to be a three month protocol. Okay. So now as we go into our step two, this fibrinolysis, we're cleaning things out. This is where we're going to take a look at the option of systemic enzymes and enzymes in general. Now I was introduced to step strong Mm, several months ago, and it was something that I've heard of digestive enzymes and have used digestive enzymes because I'm a huge believer in digestive health and the gut biome and how influential the gut is to the brain and everything else. But I wasn't fully familiar with the systemic side of enzymes. And I am definitely hooked and it is now a big part of my practice. So I hope that you find that similar curiosity and excitement around enzymes and and the products at Step Strong and how you could potentially use that with your patients. So let's just start by looking at enzymes as a whole. Now, enzymes are a type of protein, and there's many, many different types of enzymes in our body. We actually have over 3,000 different types of enzymes. And when you think of enzymes, one that comes to mind is lactase, right? Which is going to break down lactose. You have lipase, which is breaking down fat. So they're very specific. So they're highly specific enzymes or proteins to help create a catalyst to a reaction. They help the efficiency of the body. Now, what happens is in certain periods, such as injury or with age, our need is going to go higher for very specific enzymes. And if we are trying to accelerate certain types of repair processes. So again, when we think of enzymes, they're proteins, we have digestive enzymes, and then we're going to have a class of systemic enzymes. Digestive enzymes, I'd already mentioned that lactase is probably the most common or most um, well-known or mainstream enzyme, digestive enzyme. And what it does is it is very specific to breaking down the lactose sugar. It has a very specific action in the gut. 
Now, systemic enzymes, sometimes they can actually be digestive enzymes, but you take them in a very specific way. To get an enzyme past the gut and into the intestine and into your bloodstream so that the mechanism of action is in your systemic systemic wide is the way that you take them is very important. You want to make sure that you are taking them without food. If you actually take the enzymes with food, they're going to act like a digestive enzyme. And uh, what they, they kind of joke about at StepStrong is they say that is a very expensive digestive enzyme if you are taking them with food. The specificity of mechanism of action of the systemic enzymes is you are trying to get it into the bloodstream, okay? So now many systemic enzymes work by eliminating and controlling and influencing the immune system, our natural immune responses. So it is also regulating our own natural response to inflammation. So you wouldn't really say that this enzyme, step strong, is an anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or Aleve. They are supporting the body's natural responses, the immune responses and the inflammatory responses. And we'll find out soon, fibrinolysis. Okay, so I'd already mentioned this, that the way that you take the enzymes is very important. To get it into the system, you want to make sure that you are taking it without food. Step Strong is a natural supplement of systemic enzymes. It's very specific enzymes for the purpose of supporting our body's natural defenses against inflammation and tissue injury, tissue repair. Air. Now, there are some key ingredients that I want to briefly go through so that you can again understand why this product is really applicable to these chronic tissue injuries. And then I'll speak briefly about how I use them in my practice. So, there are four main systemic enzymes in StepStrong. The first one, serapeptase. Serapeptase, again, is a systemic enzyme, and it has anti-inflammatory, anti-edema, remember the vasodilation, and then fibrinolytic properties. And it it's actually really cool that it comes from the silkworm. And when the silkworm is trying to break out of its uh, cocoon, it is essentially releasing serapeptase to break down that fibrin cocoon. Now, there is a lot of really cool and exciting research around the use of serapeptase to regulate our natural defense against inflammation and fibrinolysis. Remember that that step two is fibrinolysis that we are trying to incorporate this enzyme therapy. Bromelin is a, another ingredient. Bromelin comes from pineapples and it actually comes from the core of the pineapple. So just eating the pineapple itself and having lots of pineapple, you actually don't get as much of the bromelin as if you take it from the core of the pineapple. So that's where it's coming from. Um, I would say it's probably one of the most mainstream. I actually had heard of bromelin before I found out about Step Strong, and I would actually recommend it to my patients for um, supporting their body's inflammatory response. Uh, so I was kind of in the right direction with that one. And then the other two is that there are proteases, which is the amylase and the lipase. These are really good for reducing swelling and edema. Again, they're very specific to the um, goals of managing the edema, managing the static inflammation in chronic tissue injury. And then the fourth one is going to be papain. And papain is coming from papayas, it's actually from the skin. So similar to bromelain is if you eat a bunch of pineapples, you don't necessarily get the concentration of the bromelain that you need. Similarly here, if you eat a bunch of, of uh, papaya, that's actually not where this enzyme is found, it's found in the skin. It's called the latex of the skin. And that is where you actually get these enzymes and the power of those enzymes. So those are four of the enzymes that you can find in Step Strong. And then there's two really powerful antioxidants. Uh, amla is a fruit from India. And you can see here this vitamin C as much as 20 oranges. I think it's actually one of the highest concentrations of vitamin C found in a fruit is amla. Um, so definitely try to stock up on some amla. Okay. And then rutin is a plant 
pigments. It's a bioflavonoid, which are really good. It's actually really good for vision as well. Um, and that's also found within Step Strong. So I'm going to share two brief case studies about using enzymes, Step Strong, for managing chronic plantar fascial symptoms. This first patient had plantar fasciitis for 15 years. So you know that most likely this is going to be a wax and wane. So a flare up, it calms down, it becomes quiescent, flare up, and then calms down. So in that flare up, some of these patients don't know where to turn. Should they be using an anti-inflammatory? Should they be using these NSAIDs that are recommended? Should they go back into their thotics? It becomes very, um, confusing to the patient with these flare-ups and how they manage it and how they actually finally break out of that cycle. So uh, Step Strong had done a research study where they had used many of the patients. These are pulled as a couple of the patients in that study. So this patient was given uh, the Step Strong. She took it one pill twice a day. So when you take Step Strong, you want to take it in the morning and the evening, like I said, without food. And they recommend taking one to two supplements or one to two pills in the morning and the evening. So when she started, she was a pain scale five out of 10. By the time she started taking the course of Step Strong, she had dropped down 40 to 60% decrease in pain, which is great. This is an all natural supplement. It's not like a systemic and said like a leave and ibuprofen. So obviously you're thinking of uh, much lower side effects. Another patient is this uh, individual was 41 years old. She had been diagnosed with plantar fasciitis for four years. So again, chronic in nature. She started with her pain scale at a level of eight out of 10. She took two pills in the morning and the evening. So twice a day. And then by day 10, so she did the 10 day cycle of step strong that her pain went down to a one. So that is a really good demonstration of the role of integrating step strong in a chronic plantar fascial patient or client. Now, again, when we are looking at the chronic tissue injury patient client, remember these four steps. So we are thinking about step one, you got to take the stress off. Step two, you have to do something to clean house and address the fibrin and the stasis that is in the environment. This is where the research and the efficacy of systemic enzymes and step strong would fall into place and into that puzzle. Step three, once we are cleaning house, we then start to stimulate the fibroblast so that we can create organized connective tissue. And then four, you start to introduce graduated stress. So from a time perspective, let's say that this is actually a patient with chronic plantar fascial symptoms is I would put them in a uh, in an orthotic, maybe a cam walker if they were really, really bad, but let's say most likely I'm just going to tell them to stop running or standing on their feet progressively, decrease their activity, you're going to go into this custom orthotic so I can control your stress and your environment. They're doing that from day one. Then for the next 10 days, because it's a 10 day protocol in the step strong box. So this is a 10 day protocol. I would have them start with this. And the, the 10 day protocol is one pill in the morning, one pill in the evening. If they do want to increase it to two and two, they absolutely can. That is the recommendation by step strong, but I would have them do this, call it for 10 days to two weeks. Okay. That is starting to clean house and introduce the fibrinolytic characteristics that we need. After the two weeks, I'm not stopping the step strong or the enzyme therapy. I'm actually continuing them. And I want them to continue this for a good six to eight weeks. And I might actually continue even longer, but let's say we're now at the two week mark. I see them again. I see how they're doing. They are usually their pain has dropped down, but I'm not ready to reintroduce them to stress yet. All I did was put fires out and get them into a quiescent state. Systems are calm. Okay. They come to me and now we're going to step three. They're continuing step two. We go to step three. I am either injecting them with a stem cell or sending them to one of you guys who is doing grastin and deep tissue to stimulate the fibroblast and the collagen formation. 
there are other modalities. There's um, shockwave therapy. There is uh, radiofrequency ablation, PRP stem cells, uh, like I said, Graston. So they're doing something for that step three. Okay. Now let's say I did stem cells. I'm going to do stem cells. And then I am going to do two rounds of stem cells in two weeks. So I do two weeks and then another injection in two weeks. Now, because I did stem cells, I'm actually going to put them in a cam walker. And that cam walker is really going to take the stress off of the system. They're there for four weeks. We are now at the six week mark. They're still most likely taking step strong because I want to continue this process as we start to reintroduce stress. I take them out of the cam walker, I put them back into that orthotic, and then I stay in that orthotic for a couple of weeks, and then I'm starting to slowly introduce stress in this graduated loading response, okay? And then we continue, essentially. And that is where I would take them over this three-month period. So from day one, me seeing them, a two-week, clean house, fibrinolysis with stem strong, continuing step strong while they are doing something to stimulate collagen. After four weeks of that, we start to reintroduce the stress to the tissue. And then I am getting them into a more organized environment. I'm getting them to create collagen fibers that have actually higher load capacity. I have an organized vascularization to the area. And I am now in a state that is not just masking a symptom or temporarily kind of almost if you think of like a fire smoldering and I'm just like getting it to smoldering and then I'm like, okay, I think we're good. No, no, we are putting out the fire and we are building strong organized tissue. And this is absolutely by far what I, I absolutely love treating these types of patients and educating them on this is how we need to be treating your injuries so that we can actually get you better and doing the things that you love to do. And I really do find that Step Strong, since me integrating Step Strong into my practice, it has just fit in perfectly into that puzzle. Until then, I really didn't have anything that I would use for that um, step two fibrinolysis period. Um, you know, stem cells and PRP do have fibrinolytic properties, but if I can upregulate that even higher through the benefits of these systemic enzymes, that's really what's really making the impact with my patients. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor for any questions that you may have, and then I am going to just briefly um, kind of mention how I, how I used step strong myself is I had, uh, I'm an aerialist by night. <laughs> so when I am, you know, not doctoring, I try to, you know, fly in the sky and I obviously stress my shoulders a lot and have had many shoulder injuries just from some of the crazy positions the shoulders have to go into um, and had really bad bilateral bicep tendonitis because of just the repetitive pattern and have tried everything from, you know, rest, CBD. I've done some stem cell injections um, in them. Didn't really have a good effect. I got step strong uh, when I met them and I tried it and I was like, you know, I, I want to try everything that I give to my patients. And I tried it. I did a 10 day course of step strong, one in the morning, one in the evening, exactly as recommended. And I'm telling you by day 10, I was like, wait a minute, my shoulders do not hurt. I'm at aerials and I'm like, oh my God, like I can do this and I don't feel my bicep tendons. And ever since then, I have not had the bicep tendon pain the same way. Does it, if I do something really silly at aerials, do I feel it kind of talk to me a little bit? Of course, right? But 99.9% .9 better. And that is where I am now obsessed with systemic enzymes. And I'm just really curious about the efficacy of these enzymes systemically and the, the way that it supports our body's own natural immune response and our inflammatory response. I really think that there is a lot of future within healthcare with these systemic enzymes. So I'm going to open it up right now to your questions. Um, 
So Bill had a question as far as what about sprained ankles? Absolutely, 100%. Think of that in this exact same way. Now, sprained ankle is, it's going to be a little bit different when you have an actual um, tear in tissue. So let's say you had plantar fasciosis and you just had thickening of the plantar fascia. That would be a slightly different regimen than if someone had a partial tear of their plantar fascia. When someone has a plantar fascial tear, a partial tear of the central band of the plantar fascia, when I go through those four steps, step three, which is for the stimulation and the organization of collagen type one and uh, fibroblast stimulation, I for sure, hands down, will do stem cells when there's a partial tear. So in the case of a ligament sprain and it's a partial tear or a full thickness tear, just know that you might need to be a little bit more aggressive on that third step. Maybe we do have to pull out shock wave or stem cells or something like that. But can you use step strong and systemic enzymes with a ankle sprain? 100%. Absolutely. Um, so Sharon asks, are they whole food supplements or nutraceuticals? So they are plant-based, they're natural supplements. And then, um, some of them are also developed from, uh, like amylase and lipase. So I would put them as more whole food supplements, but again, they're coming from the skin, and the core of the pineapple versus the actual pulp of the foods. But if you want to find out for sure, I would email StepStrong, um, hello at stepstrong.com, which is on this last slide. But that's a very good question, Sharon. Uh, so Claris asks, can you use StepStrong for something other than plantar fasciitis? Yes, absolutely. And I do apologize that I kept using blinder fasciitis as an example. Um, that is where I use like my bicep tendonitis. I, I used it for that. That's an example. Um, there's actually some really good research that is around osteoarthritis. So anyone, if you're thinking of like a joint inflammation, chronic joint pain, absolutely 100%. If you're thinking anything, maybe a little bit higher up, maybe with the lower back, the hamstrings, the elbows, the wrists, so different um, orthopedic sites, absolutely. Um, and they actually have a really good physician's guide that has research of the application of systemic enzymes for things like um, COPD and, and other things that are, um, not related to orthopedic and they will absolutely send you that so that you can learn more about it. Um, and kind of along lines with that is if you are interested in learning more about either trying them and speaking them to learn more and say, Hey, I would really love to try this. I would suggest reaching out to step strong at hello at stepstrong.com um, and trying it get information. If you do want to recommend this to patients, they do have a wholesale program. So it is something that you absolutely can integrate into your practice if you're interested. Um, so Michelle says, I realize our focus and emphasis is on foot pathology. And you mentioned other ligament issues, <coughs> excuse me, um, resolve with enzyme therapy, but what might be the impact on chronic lower back pain? A bit of a black sheep in the chronic pain world. <coughs> I would say that if you had, <clears throat> my goodness, I don't know where my water is. <clears throat> so a lot of low back issues. <laughs> so <sorry. clears throat> All right. A lot of low back issues are kind of have that chronic arthritic nature <clears throat> themselves. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to find my water. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, meaning that if it's a spondylolisthesis or a narrowing of the vertebra and that you're starting to put some compression on the nerves, what I have started doing with StepStrong is some of my chronic nerve patients, neuropathies, nerve entrapments, neuromas. I've actually started integrating step strong as well and have had really good results. Um, so that is where back pain, is it 
disc? Is it the joints, right? So kind of where, where is that and what is that? Um, so yes, I mean, I would say yes, broadly, but very specific, what is that individual's cause of low back pain? Um, and what I think all of the listeners here is you are doing these corrective exercises, you're strengthening the cores, you're looking at the posture, you're thinking of the foot core, you're thinking about the nervous system. This, this is one piece of that puzzle where I find a little bit um, of inconsistency, you could say, of results with anything is if someone says, I'm not going to change anything and I'm just going to use step strong and it's going to be the, the thing that finally takes away my, um, you know, tennis elbow or my bicep tendonitis or my plantar fasciitis. Now I think I found it. And then they try it for 10 days and they say, didn't help, you know, this is crazy that you can't, obviously you can't do that. You can't do one thing and then not change anything else with anyone's program. So you have to be looking at what am I doing from balancing the stress? What am I doing, which could be posture? What am I doing from looking at the organization? How am I slowly introducing load? So um, yes to the back pain, it's a piece of the puzzle, but we need to look at everything else also. Uh, Carol asked, as a personal trainer, can we recommend step strong? So I would say kind of in the gray area of, um, of you're not prescribing, right? But you could say, hey, this is interesting. Why don't you look at that? Right. And then they're making the decision on themselves. So you're not uh, giving them direct advice, I guess, would be the, the legal protective. However, yes. Can you say, hey, there's this interesting website, stepstrong.com. Go check it out. Absolutely, you can do that. It is a uh, over-the-counter, non-prescriptive supplement of systemic enzymes. Um, would Step Strong work well for a Haglund's deformity? Yes, because Haglund's deformity is often associated with the Achilles tendon and the bursa that sits there. So, are we making sure at the exact same time with this individual who has a hag lens that we are taking away the stiff counter. Maybe we're using a heel lift. Maybe we're making sure that we release the plantar fascia and the soleus above to control the stress while we are doing this from a natural immune response supporter in that situation. So yes, you absolutely can. You would just uh, want to incorporate everything else that I said with that. Okay. Ah, Michelle said, go get your water. I'm better now. I survived. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so Clara says, thank you. That's exactly what I was wondering. Low back arthritis, knee pain. Exactly. Yes. So outside other parts. Excellent. Great. So great questions. Are there any other questions? If not, again, you will be getting this recording. You will be getting the PowerPoint. I do encourage you to check out Step Strong. If you have questions for them, please reach out to them. If you have any questions for me on how I use uh, systemic enzymes in my practice, please let me know. If you have any questions on chronic tissue injuries and how I take my patients through that protocol, please do let me know. If you have any case studies or you want any second opinions on any patients, please do let me know. I try to make myself available to help you help others. I thank you guys so much for your time and I hope to see you on a future webinar. Have an amazing day or night.